Hello, I'm Axel Wilkinson for HipFilm.com. This tutorial is a companion to our 2D tracking tutorial, and here we will cover the techniques used to create the final effects that we set our tracking up for. All of the effects rely on 2D tracking to control their movement, so it's important that the tracking is done before we begin here. We're going to basically pick up from where that previous tutorial left off. There are two fundamental effects involved here. The blinking light, which is pretty simple, so we're going to start with that, and then we'll move on to the screen projection, which uses a lot more elements and is a little more complex. For the light, we need to start with a plane. We'll name that something logical, and then we'll leave the color at black, and that way we can go into the layer properties, change the blend mode to add, and that's going to remove all the black, but any bright effects that we add to the layer will still remain visible. So we can go in, grab our light flares effect, add it to the layer, and I started with a golden artifacts preset as my starting point, and then we can use the hotspot position controls to select our antenna track, parent this to that layer, and then zero out the center properties to put that right square onto our antenna. To reduce the lens flare effect and make it more of just a light, I set the quantity of the rays to zero, and then in the other elements I set the brightness to zero as well. And this leaves us with just the hot spot, the bright light in the center. And so I adjusted the scale of that to about 0.4 so it matches the size of the antenna better. And then in the global settings I increased the saturation all the way to get a rich orange color to the effect. So now we can use the flicker effect to create the blinking and by setting the randomness to zero we can get consistent timing to the blink and then we can increase the amplitude to adjust the difference in intensity between the extreme bright and extreme dim portions of the effect. By setting that just over one, we'll get it so the light is basically turning on and off. And then we can adjust the frequency to control how fast the light blinks. If we hit play, you can see right now it's blinking pretty fast. So I set that to around 2.4, but you can easily adjust that speed uh, to suit your preference. Now the last thing we need to do is find the frame where we want the blinking to start and then we will trim this plane layer to begin at that frame. If we hit play, you can see we've got our blinking light effect there created just within a couple minutes. So now on to the fun bit, the screen projection. The first thing I want to do is adjust this screen layer so that it blends better onto our prop. To start with, I'll decrease the opacity of the layer to about 40%, so it's somewhat transparent. And then if we change the blend mode in the layer properties to add, uh, that gives us a pretty good start for blending the layer. The next thing I want to do is try to feather the edges a little bit, and so to do that I'm going to use a mask. Since this layer is a 3D plane and is sitting at a weird angle to the camera, the easiest way to draw the mask is to switch to the layer panel and then we can just use the rectangular mask tool to draw a mask basically the same size and shape as the layer. Now we can adjust the properties of this mask to soften the edges of the layer. We'll increase the feather to around 20 and then the roundness will increase as well and you can see how the edges are softening up as we do that. So somewhere right in there I think looks pretty good. Now if we switch back to the viewer to see how that looks on the prop, that's looking much better. Now I want to add a flicker to this layer as well just to make it look a little bit more like an analog transmission. And so in the flicker on this case I want to keep the amplitude a little bit lower but I'm going to increase the frequency significantly so that it flashes much more quickly. If we play through that's looking pretty good but the layer in general needs to be a little bit brighter I think. And So I'm going to use a crush blacks and whites effect from the color folder I'll add that on and then if we just bring the whites down you can see how the brighter areas of the layer brighten up there somewhere around 55 does nicely now if we play through let's deselect that and that screen is now blending much more convincingly onto our prop now we need to duplicate the screen layer to create our projection I knew going in that we would need several copies of this screen layer to create the final effect and so by adding some of the effects to the layer before I duplicate it, now when I duplicate the layer, all of the adjustments that we've made will already exist on the copy. And so it saves us having to repeat all of those steps for each copy that we create. All right, I'm going to rename the copy to projection so that we can tell the difference between the layers. And then I am going to parent this layer to our screen layer. 
and you'll notice right away that it seems to not line up properly. So we need to adjust the transform controls of this layer so that it does. In our 2D tracking tutorial, we added keyframes to the position and orientation of the original screen layer. But since we're parenting this layer to it, we'll want to remove all those keyframes and then just zero out the position and orientation properties for this layer. And now you can see it lines up perfectly with the original screen layer that we created. So, next we can take our projection layer and we're going to move it up. I want to raise it on the z-axis by 250. And then we're going to increase the scale to double what it is right now. And there's the basis for our holographic projection. It's a good start, but now we need to make a few adjustments to improve the look of the effect. First on the mask, I'm going to decrease the expansion. I'm going to bring it down to minus 8. And that's just going to bring the edges of the effect in a little bit. And then I'm going to increase the roundness as well, just to soften the edges and the corners a bit further. So that gives us a pretty good start for our hologram, but it could still benefit from some more richness and contrast. A large part of the issue is that by using the Add Blend Mode, we've removed all of the blacks from our projected image. So all of the areas in that screen layer that had dark colors have basically just become completely transparent. So to add some of those blacks back in, I'm going to create another copy of this projection layer. I'm going to rename this one so we can distinguish between them. And I'm going to change the blend mode of this copy to multiply. And that's going to remove all the light areas and just leave the darks. If we shift this layer down a bit so it is below our main projection layer, maybe set the Z depth to 245 instead of 250, then it allows the brighter layer above to build off of it and gives more depth to our effect. Okay, let's switch back to our projection layer. And I want to add a glow effect to this to help brighten it up and give it more of a holographic appearance. So in the stylize folder, we'll drag that glow effect onto our projection layer. And for the glow, I'm going to set the blend to add just to make it a little bit more intense. And reducing the radius a bit to around 20 restores some detail to the image that the glow is blurring out. Now I want to make the highlights in that projected image a little bit brighter. So I'm going to duplicate this projection layer once again. I'm going to delete the glow off of this layer. And then in the crush blacks and whites effect, I'm going to adjust that so that only the highlight areas of this layer are affected. So let's rename this copy to projection highlights. And then I'm going to adjust the Z setting on this one to 255. So it's up above our main projection layer just a bit. And that gives us three different layers to give some nice depth to the effect. So now if we play that back, you can see it's looking pretty good. But the flicker is a little bit too intense now with all of those layers flickering together. And so on the highlights layer of the projection, I'm going to adjust the seed of the flicker just to throw it out of sync with the other two layers. And that way, hopefully, it'll give a little bit more variety and life to the effect and reduce the intensity that's building up with all of those flickering together. Next, we need to create the projection elements that tie the hologram to the screen. I used a beam at each corner and a particle effect through the center. The beams were created using a straightened out lightning effect based on the technique from our recent tutorial on 2D lasers. But first, I created some points to keep the beams in place. So let's create a new point. We'll convert it to 3D. We're going to parent it to our screen layer. And then in the transform properties, we will zero out its position and orientation settings. Let's disable those projection layers. You can see that now that point is right in the center of our main screen layer. And so now we can adjust its position so that it lines up with one of the corners of this layer. And once that's in position there, very quickly as we drag through, it's going to stay locked right to that corner of the layer it's parented to. Now we can duplicate that layer. And with the copy, we'll just move that over to one of the other corners. And then we can select both of those points, duplicate both of them at once, and we'll move these copies down to the bottom corners of the screen. So now we have four points, which are all named new point. So to be able to clearly tell which one is which, we'll select each one in turn and give them logical names so that we can keep track of things.
changing these names so that we can identify them quickly later on is really going to make things easier. Okay, so now we have our four points which are parented to the screen layer. And since the screen layer is tracked, as we scrub through, you can see those points stay locked perfectly in position relative to that layer. Now I'm going to use the exact same techniques to create four more points that line up with the corners of the projection layer. And these will serve as the opposite end of each of our corner beams. I'm going to go ahead and skip to the end since we've already covered how to do that. So these four points are parented to our projection layer. They're named accordingly, so I know they're the projection points. So now we need a new plane to create our beam effects on. We'll name it Beams. We'll keep it on black so that once again we can use the Add Blend Mode to remove the plane and then we'll add a lightning and electricity effect to that plane. Now we can use those points we've created in the start and end controls of the lightning effect to lock it into position. So for this one, if we choose the top left screen as the start point, and then for the end point choose the top left projection, then we can zero out those start point positions. And now we've got this lightning arcing between the two corner points there at the top left which is kind of cool in itself, but we want it to be more of a beam, not so much lightning. So let's set the wave scale to zero to straighten that out. We'll set the branch quantity to zero to remove those. And I kind of like a little bit of twitch in the effect to give it some life, uh, if it has a little bit of wobble there. So I'm not going to remove the twitch scale entirely. I'm going to bring it down to about 0 0.1. Let's adjust the start and end width properties so that the beam widens as it projects upward. And so if the start width is at 1, maybe let's adjust the end width to about 3 or so, I don't know, somewhere in there so that it looks good. And now we just need to dial in the appearance of the effect. So in the glow, we'll change the color to an orangey yellow that better matches our projection image. Then we'll increase the radius all the way up and the feather as well to give a nice large soft beam. And then the scatter I'm also going to bring up to 1. And you'll notice this creates a bit of a grainy appearance to the effect, which I rather like for the aesthetic I'm going for. In the core settings, I reduced the core opacity down to 33% to lighten that core up significantly. Once we have the appearance of this first beam exactly the way we want it, then we can duplicate it for the three other corners, and all four copies will automatically look exactly the same. So, we're not going to duplicate this layer, we're just going to use four copies of the lightning effect, which can all live on the same plane. So we'll make a total of four copies here, and then we can rename each of them so that we can quickly identify which corner is which. And then we can just go through selecting each one in turn and assigning the start and end points to the correct points so that they line up to the corresponding corners. And it's during this point that you're going to be really glad that you took the time to rename all of those points earlier so you can quickly tell which ones are which. And that gets all four of our beams nicely locked into place. So to finish off the beams, let's find the frame where the projection begins and then we can trim the layer so that it starts at that point. And then I want to tweak the opacity of the entire layer just to make all of these beams a little bit more subtle. Those are a little bit too intense still, I think, so I'm going to bring that down about a third to 70% or so just to soften those beams more. The last element that I added to this scene is a particle effect, which fills in between the screen and the projection. So for that, I just started with a default 3D particle simulator, and then we are going to adjust the emitter shape to quad, and then we can actually attach that to our screen layer so that it lines up with that. And then we can match it to the shape of that layer by adjusting the width and height. To make the particle effect expand as the projection enlarges, we can set the trajectory to cone. And then we can adjust the angle of that to around 40, 45 degrees. And then we'll need to adjust the orientation as well. We're going to set the Y orientation to 90 degrees to get it so the particles are coming up out of the screen. And so if we play that back, you can see now it looks like all of those particles are just coming straight up out of our prop. Now we want the particles to only last the time it takes for them to travel the distance between the screen and the projection. So that's a matter of finding a balance between the life and speed properties of the particle system. 
We set a distance of 250 pixels between our screen and our projection, if you recall. So if we want the particles to take one second to travel that distance, then a speed of 250 and a life of one would get us there. If we wanted them to move faster, a speed of 500 and a life of 0 0.5 would work as well. Since the speed is the distance per second that the particles travel, then once you determine the distance the particles have to move, some basic math can quickly calculate a life and speed combination that will get you there. So that handles the movement of the particles nicely, but now I want to increase the number of particles. So in the general controls for the layer, let's adjust the particles per second to 400. That looks a little bit thick right now, but it's going to work great once we dial in the appearance. So first, we need to import a texture. I used a long vertical texture, which I created for use in laser effects a while back. And the color is built into this texture, but with the color source set to birth color, which is the default, then whatever color we select for the effect will be applied to the particles regardless of what colors appear in the texture itself. So I selected an orange color to match our other effects, and these are obviously too big right now, so in the movement controls, let's adjust the scale down to about 30%. Now let's adjust the alignment of our textures. With billboarding enabled, we're basically looking straight onto the front of every texture regardless of how the particle is moving, so let's disable billboarding, and then enable align to motion and now the textures will align themselves to the paths that the particles are following. Now let's change the blend mode on this effect to add and that's obviously way too bright so we'll adjust the alpha we'll bring it down quite a lot uh, down to about 15 to make this effect much more subtle. This relegates those particles into a supporting role where they're enhancing that effect but they're not detracting from the actual hologram, which is the main focus of the scene. Now we can find the frame where our projection appears and then just trim our particle effect so that it starts at the same time. So that's all of the elements of our shot in place. The last thing I want to do is add a little bit of animation to the intro of that, so rather than starting abruptly it looks like the effects are coming up out of the screen. I want the layers to start perfectly matched to the size and position of the actual screen, then have them rise and enlarge as the effect starts. So the best way to approach this is actually to go a bit backward. We're going to start by creating the last keyframe and then move to the first keyframes. So let's find the frame where we want our layers to reach full size, uh, where this animation will end, maybe five frames in, and then on this frame we will activate keyframing for the scale and position properties of all three of the layers that make up our projection. And we'll just do that for each of these three layers. And now from that keyframe on, everything that we've done to these layers will stay exactly as it is. And we can proceed to make adjustments before that keyframe to create our animation. So now we find the first frame of those layers, and if we just zero out the position and set the scale back to 100%, then now that layer is perfectly matched to our original screen layer. And we can do this for each of our three projection layers as well, so that all three of them match up to our original screen layer. And there we have it. And since our beams are tracked with the points to the corners of those projection layers, they automatically follow the corners as we animate that scale. Nifty, huh? Now, I pulled one final trick to add just a little bit more interest to this animation. And that is that I adjusted the timing for each of the three projection layers so that they separate a bit more as they rise. They move at different speeds. So to do this, I simply adjusted the end keyframes of the animation of each layer. On the whites layer, I moved them to the left by one frame, so that layer moves a little bit faster. And then on the blacks layer, I moved those keyframes to the right by one frame. So it moves a little bit slower, and that way it just gives a little bit more complexity and interest to that effect. And that's the end. That completes the visual effects for this scene. Hopefully you learned something and I covered the concepts in such a way that you can apply them to other projects you might be working on uh, rather than just replicating this exact effect. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't yet. We have more cool tutorials on the way. We love to see the work that you guys are creating with HitFilm so please share that with us and thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.